And welcome back to You Rejoin at 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Regina. And today we're going to be talking about another logical fallacy, the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, uh, which is Latin, so you may not understand those particular words, but they roughly translate to something like, quote, after this, therefore, because of this. It is confusing the, I guess, nature of causality such that uh, you're associating uh, what happens uh, in what order with the nature of what caused what. Uh, and so why would this be a problem? What, what possibly could go wrong if we just assume that things uh, that follow other things to be caused by those first things? Uh, well, the first problem is, is it could be that the causal relationship, uh, i.e. which is the cause which is the effect, uh, you've got completely backwards. Uh, so this is something that you can usually make this mistake no matter what the cause and effect are. So for example, uh, when the rooster crows uh, immediately before sunrise, uh, therefore the rooster uh, causes the sun to rise, which is of course pure baloney, because the sun will rise whether or not you shoot the rooster, uh, and it has nothing to do whatsoever with whether or not the rooster crows except insofar as the rooster probably crows because the sun rises. Uh, I don't know the, the full mechanism of it, but I would not be surprised if they can actually see it some way of, of light that we can't, and so that they're awake earlier than we can. But so, somehow their body, or their you know, primitive little bird brain, realizes that it's time to crow right before sunrise and starts crowing. Uh, but you can see that the causal relationship is that causes the crow to call. It's not the other way around. Which is, of course, if you try to assume that it was the other way around, because it just so happens that the sun rose after, you would be mistaken. It could also be that it's just a coincidence that your effect is after your cause. So, for example, here in beautiful Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada, uh, here in home base, uh, the kind of hacker space here, we have a lot of computers. And we have people who will come to these computers who don't normally have a lot of experience using computers on their own. And as luck may have it, sometimes the programs they're using misbehave. They crash, the computers crash, the computers freeze, the computer uh, program that they're using uh, doesn't do uh, something very simple like open a window properly. You know, things go wrong. And so their default um, interpretation of what that means is that the computer doesn't like them, or that they did something wrong, or that they were bad and the computer is punishing them somehow. Uh, I've seen this in more than a couple of people, especially children, uh, who don't understand that software is made by human beings, and often enough times it is imperfect, it has bugs. All software, given complexity, <laughs> has bugs. And so their interpretation that it was somehow their fault uh, that the computer is misbehaving uh, is not necessarily true. Of course it could be, uh, but th making the conclusion just based on this you know, pattern of they start to use a computer and the computer misbehaves uh, isn't necessarily the way to make that kind of call. It could also be that in addition to having the causality reversed, uh, having it just be a coincidence, that there could be a third cause or a third factor that would cause uh, your effect. Uh, and your cause to happen in the particular order that they occurred in. So for example, uh, if you, apparently if you go to uh, so soil analysis, uh, especially with uh, soil closer to the top, so top soil, um, kind of surface soil, that sort of thing, um, over the recent history, you will find a greater concentration of lead, aluminum, barium, and strontium uh, than say a deeper soils or uh, that you would have found uh, in the past. Uh, and indeed, uh, as uh, since the invention of the airplane, uh, we've seen a lot more trails that planes leave through the sky, these kind of contrails. And so you could conclude from that that therefore these contrails that these planes leave, these, these lines through the sky that follow them, uh, must actually be quote unquote chemtrails. Uh, which are contain lead, aluminum, barium, strontium, and so on. 
uh, and that they're purposefully spraying these elements into the atmosphere and that they're landing on the soil and that somehow the government is using this to brainwash us or something. Uh, of course, that is also baloney because uh, there are other factors involved in both uh, the predomination of lead, aluminum, barium, and strontium in the soil and the fact that we have airplanes. For example, that we have this you know, technologically advanced uh, industrial society. <coughs> uh, we are changing the nature of our environment uh, in complex ways based on our using of lead and aluminum and so on. And there may be reasons why, uh, especially lead, uh, is present in uh, areas of our environment, including the soil, <coughs> uh, in ways that would not have been the case uh, before we invented airplanes, but not because we invented airplanes, but because we're doing a lot of things with lead, aluminum, barium, and strontium. Now, of course, I don't know, at least in the case of aluminum, barium, and strontium, that that's in fact why those uh, particular elements are in the soil. They could just be there uh, due to geological re reasons. Uh, but it, it at least stands to reason that the, this, uh, uh, I guess, presence could very well uh, be due to uh, some other third cause, such as, uh, say, use of lead gasoline, for example. Uh, so, the, and then the, the problem here is that, uh, and the, the, the fourth thing that can go wrong, uh, is that we have to somehow learn causes and effects. Uh, that our entire life is built on our understanding of what causes what, and we certainly uh, have uh, enough things following other things that uh, there, there's ample, um, I guess, opportunity for us to make that conclusion, even if we were to make random conclusions, which by the way, if we're talking about making random conclusions, we're, we're getting dangerously close to the idea of random functions, which is something talked about in the 10 ideas 50 years uh, first video, uh, which you could go and watch that. But even ignoring that, uh, if you're just kind of or making random hypotheses of, uh, in general, uh, you can often enough stumble upon, okay, well, this causes this. You know, the crow causes the sun. Is that true? Uh, and that is, okay, to some extent, is okay. It's okay to make a hypothesis that can be tested. It's not okay to believe that hypothesis uh, if before even attempting to find other possible causes. Um, and certainly if there's evidence to the contrary, uh, you should accept that evidence. Uh, and so we, we do have to think carefully about assigning causal relations, uh, but we should remain skeptical uh, about our decision until we have a lot of data supporting it. And even when it's supported by a lot of data, there should be some level of skepticism, some possible chance that we had the causal relationship backwards. And especially for really bad things, uh, tragedies, and, uh, places, events where people get killed, uh, sometimes it can be comforting to think that we understand the cause uh, without actually going through and verifying that we have the causal relationship right. Uh, and, but it would be better, uh, and often enough we can uh, prevent tragedies uh, by understanding things the way they are rather than the way we'd like them to be, or rather than taking the sloppy or lazy path and just associating the first thing that could be associated with it uh, merely by uh, what happened in what order. If we want to keep from getting hurt, we're going to have to get the causal relationships right, we're going to have to understand what actually happened, and we're going to have to understand what came first, what came second. Uh, one area where this has gone horribly wrong is in the case of cargo cults, uh, which were these kind of groups, I think they were in the uh, Pacific? Might have been Pacific. Either way, some island somewhere, uh, or some couple of islands somewhere, uh, where groups of people would, would see at the end of World War II, or during World War II, uh, where people in planes would come, and then they would bring food, they would bring uh, goodies, they would bring all sorts of stuff uh, as part of the war effort, and they would, as being nearby these people, would gain access to them. Uh, and then when they left, or when the war ended, suddenly the plane stopped coming. And so they would have these elaborate rituals uh, where they would create runways uh, or things that would look very much like runways. And they would uh, create air airport-like things and, and kind of wave people down in the right way uh, that you would wave people down if you were waving down an airplane and so on, where, where they basically learned this kind of relationship between their looking like an airport or looking like uh, 
they're kind of supporting this airport industry uh, without understanding the necessary uh, kind of reasons why an airplane filled with goodies would arrive at their island. Another place where you can run into this is the whole idea of pray or prayer. A lot of people, and most of the population of this world, believes in one of the three monotheistic religions, uh, and all three of them at least uh, give lip service to the idea that praying actually does something. Uh, whereas, mo when you find someone praying, chances are uh, they're praying for something to happen and not taking into account uh, whether or not that thing would happen anyway, and whether or not uh, the the, the over a long run of their doing so, uh, whether they have actually changed anything uh, above mere chance. Uh, so, for example, if you're uh, uh, safe aboard an ice boat expedition, as uh, in the case of um, the TV series Big Bang Theory, Sheldon, uh, and you know he, he, that someone was praying for him and his safety, his safety was not because of the prayer. Actually, it was because it's a fictional series, and uh, it could have turned out any way they have would have wanted, but in this case it, it really doesn't matter, uh, because he, whether you're safe or not does not depend on uh, someone chatting or saying something to themselves, you know, hundreds of miles away. It, there's no causal connection there whatsoever. Uh, and another, uh, I guess, area where you can run into trouble with this uh, is if uh, you're actually taking, or somehow uh, your body is starts re uh, producing too much of uh, dopamine. Uh, apparently, if you kind of overload on dopamine for long enough, you can actually trick your body into believing that associations, especially with really bright, flashy things uh, that reward you, uh, are worth, uh, I, I guess, partaking in. So, for example, if you fall into uh, a, a casino, uh, it will really seem like you're winning, even or that you should be playing, even if you are uh, losing and going broke and having to sell your house to pay for your... Uh, kind of gambling problem. Uh, so dopamine is intrinsically related to this in the dopamine system uh, and the way that our bodies associate in our minds uh, what cause does what. Uh, what some other examples of this? Well, you could kind of avoid hospitals entirely because a lot of people die there and so you don't really want to go to a hospital because you have a much you know greater chance of dying in a hospital than, you know, anywhere else you could be, practically. And of course, the problem is, is there's this other factor involved, which is that most people who go to hospitals tend to be sick or injured or are mortally wounded or whatever. Uh, there's a reason for you to go to a hospital, and if you purely ignore, or if you ignore that reason and just look at the statistics of who dies where, yeah, of course hospitals are going to be more likely to have deaths happen in them just based on that factor. Uh, it should be pointed out that there's a whole science dedicated to how not to commit this fallacy. Uh, it's called etiology, if I'm pronouncing that right. Something like that. Um, and it's a subset of medicine. Uh, you can uh, probably take entire classes in it. Um, and so you can learn how at least uh, for hundreds of years uh, people have been dealing with this problem of asso associating how or what causes what, which is something that happens all the damn time in the medical world. And it's a problem where there are life and death consequences for getting it right and wrong. So, kind of as mentioned with dopamine, there, there are reasons why our body, as thinking beings ourselves, uh, fails at this. And we associate sometimes uh, the wrong cause to the things that we feel or the things that are, are, are ex cause our experiences. And this goes quite to a low level, as mentioned, with the dopamine. So you can actually train yourself uh, to be afraid and to train yourself to, to cry uh, and to experience bad emotions by the association with things that uh, were either scare you or cause you pain, etc. Although it's more, or it's easier to do with children um, unfortunately, this we know by experience and by experiment. Someone actually did go out and do the experiment where you, you know, made children afraid of things like teddy bears. Uh, but you can uh, basically associate uh, uh, terrible things uh, with whatever 
they, they perceive, the whole Pavlov's dog thing, right? Where you, you know, introduce food, the dog drools. You introduce food, or introduce food, introduce a bell, uh, the dog drools. Introduce food, introduce, introduce a bell, the dog drools. And you kind of condition them that way, and you slowly remove the food out of the situation, and the dog maintains the association with the bell. Same thing goes with uh, unpleasant, or at least very bad experiences uh, with human beings. And a lot of the discussion online uh, in regards to the concept of triggers uh, and PTSD and the, the kinds of uh, kind of prevention of people experiencing this kind of second uh, association with their terrible experiences in their life is related to this because their body has committed this fallacy. They're, they have learned in their own physical uh, substance, substrate of how they actually encode memory uh, without even a, being conscious of it, of associating their experience with some cause that is not actually uh, the thing that harmed them. And so it's worth considering at least that this isn't just something that you can do consciously, but it's something that your body will actually commit uh, just as part of its kind of uh, reflexes and, and keeping uh, the world uh, away from hurting it. Uh, and so in addition to that, there's also a part of your brain that creates, uh, by default, uh, narratives and explanations for what you are doing. Uh, and usually it will create a narrative that paints you in a good light, or paints you as the good guy in the situation. Uh, and this can, in, as well, uh, commit this fallacy a lot, and can kind of say that you uh, were in control of a situation when in fact you were not. Uh, or say that you caused some situation when in fact that you did not or when, in fact, that situation would have occurred anyway. And so, uh, in general, uh, if, if you have a cause, an effect, uh, make sure that you've got the right cause for your effect. Uh, go through some extra work, try to test it. Uh, use experiment, use science. Uh, try to, to verify uh, using different means than just your own opinion whether or not you have the cause and effect in the right order, and things will be much better for you in the long run. Do we have any questions from the audience today? Uh, can you go over that rooster part again, Lee? Yeah, so, okay, so the rooster. I think it was because the sun came up for you. Now this is, the, the, the hypothetical situation is that the rooster crows first, and then the sun rises. And so the argument is that the rooster is in somehow controlling the sun and how it rises. It's causing the sun to rise. This bird, this little thing that weighs probably like one kilogram, is somehow making, you know, this, I don't know how heavy the sun is, maybe like a trillion kilograms or something. You know, it's moving it somehow. Of course that's ridiculous, because birds cannot cause the sun to do anything. You throw a, a bird at the sun, it just fries. There, there is very, very little control. Uh, I guess there's a, like a little tiny bit of gravitational control or something, but you, you know, it's, it's just there is no control that birds have. And if you make this conclusion that you know, the first thing that happens is the, the, the rooster crows and then the sun rises, you, you, know, you could, if you didn't know about the situation, make this conclusion. But you'd be wrong to do so because you'd be committing the post hoc fallacy. You'd be saying, oh. after this, therefore, because of this. Um, now I get it. I'll trade you now. Make sense? Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Well, and if there's any other questions, uh, there's, um, as usual, any, anywhere where this video is posted, you can ask them and uh, kind of make, make uh, fallacious statements of this nature. Uh, and uh, as usual, there should be a little Bitcoin donation address so that you can uh, send us money so we can buy more whiteboard markers. Very important. Um, and uh, I guess we'll see you next video.